Hello everybody, it's me, Stephen Billings here, and we're doing another Top 5 Weekly. And as you can see, we're hosting this on the Film Club Central page instead. Uh, Dan could not make it tonight, um, so I told him I would host it for him. And you'll also see this uh, later on the Best Damn Movie Show page. He will upload it to there later. But for now, this is live on Film Club Central. And also with me tonight, we have Mr. Andrew Cabral. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, Dan me uh, messaged me early and said... Uh, I can't do the show. Can you do it with Steven? I said, I will only do it if Steven can do it. Um, yeah, mostly yeah. because he sets it up and I don't really know how to use Google Hangout yet. So, but yeah, but that's, that's not, that's something else. It's something else. No, nah, no, nah, man. We're just, we just <laughs> love talking movies. We're, we're, we're movie buddies. We, yeah. I mean, we spend a lot of time just like shooting the shit, talking criterions, which the criterion sale is consuming our lives right now. We're like buying so know? many movies. Stephen and I are in an arms race to end all arms race. If you thought the USA and the USSR and the Cold War were something, you haven't seen anything yet. But uh, tonight we are talking about uh, Stephen King movie adaptations, and there have been quite a few of them over the years. And we're doing it this week uh, because the Dark Tower movie is out, and it is yet again another movie adaptation from a Stephen King book. Um, Steven will be talking about that a little later. I haven't seen it yet, so he'll fill you in on what he thinks about it. Um, but yeah, it should be an interesting show because there's a lot of Stephen King movies to talk about. Yeah, there's there's a lot of them. Um, not all of them are great, <laughs> but you know, there, it's some of it. Some of it is is in the eye of the beholder. Like like all films are subjective. There's some that are that are not people would consider bad movies, but you might like it. Um, Dan has sent me his list. We'll we'll show Dan's list at the end of the episode so that he you guys can know where Dan stands. But um, as usual, we start with number five. And Andrew, what is your number five? My number five is a film that may not be on a lot of people's countdowns, uh, top fives, if you will. But it's a film that I thought I would just talk about, um, and that is the Dead Zone, which is directed by. David Cronenberg, and if you were to watch this movie, you wouldn't uh, think that it was directed by David Cronenberg because this movie's kind of sandwiched in to, to all of his other body horror movies where they're just gross, but the practical effects are amazing, and they're just kind of crazy movies in and of themselves. But The Dead Zone is like, we, we, like this whole list is going to be about a book um, adaptation by, from Stephen King, and and it is starring Christopher Walken, who kind of um, dies and then comes back to life. And he is now a psychic. He can ha he has these visions of moments that are going to happen in the near future, and he is trying to um, f affect. He's trying to um, utilize them to to like save certain people, to warn certain people that things are going to happen. And if I were to tell you that Christopher Walken was going to be a psychic in a movie, I think that's enough to sell the movie in and of itself. The Stephen King name and the book is is all kind of just gravy to me. The fact you get 1980s Steve, uh, uh, Christopher, Christopher Walken uh, is enough for me. And it's a cool movie. It's an underrated movie. It's not, I would say, one of the most amazing Stephen King um, movie adaptations, but it's I think it's solid and it's really an interesting film for for David Cronenberg uh, because it, I feel that it is so different amongst the other things he was doing at the time. Yeah, and it also spawned a TV show, which I I thought the TV show was was pretty damn good um, for for the most part. I mean, it it ends kind of weird because I don't think they they got the ending quite at the time that they wanted to, but. But um, it, it it you know Anthony Michael Hall plays the lead character in that. It I, I liked it. I liked it. Um, but yeah, that's a great choice, man. I like Dead Zone. Um, and you know I'm a Cronenberg fan, so <laughs> yeah. Um, my number five is gonna be one that is kind of in that category of like I know it's not really a great film, but it's one that I grew up watching, which is kind of weird saying that out loud because it's a it's a weird Stephen King movie. Um, but I saw I remember picking this up on VHS. Um, back when there was Kroger, which Kroger was a grocery store in our in, in my area um, that then turned into Harris Teeters. Um, and they used to have video stores in their grocery stores. And they were doing a whole going out of business. And this was one of the ones I grabbed out of there. And it was thinner, thinner, Stephen King's thinner. Wow. And it, yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
th this doesn't really have any big stars in it. The, the main guy in it, Robert John Burke, which is mostly for me known for being in uh, uh, Rescue Me as one of the uh, related to the to Dennis Leary's character. He he used to be a priest and now he's like a, dealing with alcoholism. But um, this movie's basically about a curse. It's a gypsy curse that's put on this man. And he slowly but surely starts to lose weight and starts to get thinner and thinner until, of course, he would eventually die. But the movie goes through events. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it's 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 just a very interesting movie. And I think uh, I just love movies about curses and, and gypsies. It's kind of a weird area that you don't see a lot of movies delve into. Um, but just the thought of, of, you know, slowly losing weight to the point – I mean, you can't even eat enough – to stop this curse, it, nothing he could do about it, and uh, it, it's it's scary. It, to me, it's a very scary thing, and and uh, I just always had a kind of a spot for that movie. I don't know why, but it was it, I, I watched it a lot growing up. It's weird, but yeah, that's my number five. Uh, number four, what do you got, Andrew? Uh, my number four is a lot uh, is a film of what people will be familiar with a lot more than my number five, and that is Misery. Of course, it is the film directed by Rob Reiner. And it stars James Caan and Kathy Bates. Basically, James Caan is this hugely famous author. He's written this very popular series of books. And he decides he's going to drive uh, into the mountains and uh, uh, write his next book. You know, kind of get away from it. But he ends up in the middle of a snowstorm and his car crashes. And he just happens to be discovered by his biggest fan of all time, portrayed by Kathy Bates. And by biggest fan, I mean most obsessive and most psychotic. Um, I don't want to spoil the film for, for anyone. I'll just say she captures him and she tortures him. <laughs> and it's very interesting commentary, I guess, on super fandom and obsession. And it's, it's something I hope if I ever become super famous one day, my fans are not this crazy. But it is a very dark movie. It's a very uh, different movie than we see from Rob Reiner before and I think since. He's never really done kind of a horror movie like this. I don't think he's really done right, much of a, a horror movie at all, really. Uh, he's used to doing kind of romantic comedies and stuff like that. But yeah, I would definitely check out Misery. Kathy Bates won an Oscar for this movie. That's how, that's how kind of critically regarded it is. And it's one of the few films uh, starring James Caan. James Caan doesn't show up in a lot of movies, not, not in many post um, his Godfather role. He was in, in Thief by Michael Mann and a few other films, but his career's kind of dissipated. It was nice to see him uh, in a movie in the 90s, you know, and it's 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 a good movie. Definitely check it out. Yeah, he, he was uh, he co-starred in uh, Elf uh, with uh, Will Ferrell. <laughs> He's on the poster. It says and James Caan. I mean, but uh, <laughs> and James Caan in there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my number four actually is also Misery. I, 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 I it's it's. Rob Reiner, I talked about this, I think, on another episode. Uh, Rob Reiner is just one of them filmmakers. I think he's severely underappreciated. Like, he's made so many great films. This is Spinal Tap, Few Good Men, um, you know, this movie, Misery, you know, When Harry Met Sally, just a lot of great films. And, uh, yeah, he's never – this is, a, this is a, a genre he never really has delved into any other time besides this one time, and it shows his – his versatility and you know two powerhouse actors in this one movie and i love movies that take place in one location um you know in this one house basically and of course it has all the stamps of a stephen king story there's he's a writer um you know even the fact that they're in the snow there there's a snow you know with the shining and you know so you know it's it's very very much you know has everything a stephen king story is supposed to have and uh it's it's just it's it's scary i mean yeah uh, it's about obsession this you know you, you you want help in this situation oh she helps you she helps you by breaking your your ankles um, <laughs> with a mallet yeah it's 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 the best she's the best um my favorite fan yeah it, and it, yeah it's it's one of them scenarios that you just it's plagues you like you start thinking about it, you're like make sure i lock the doors make sure i have enough gas when i go somewhere I don't want to get famous. Mm -mm, I'm not driving. This I, know, I want to get semi-famous. Like I don't want to. I want to get like right below James Conn and Misery famous. <laughs> yeah, like, just enough to where nobody's gonna bother me. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Misery is my number four. It's 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 a it's just a it's a must see movie, definitely from the Stephen King specially. Um, so now we're uh, at this midway point, and uh, Andrew has not seen Dark Tower. So I will. I'm going to speak a little bit about the Dark Tower. Um, obviously, a, a running series uh, of Stephen King uh, books. Um, this movie doesn't. I've never read the book, so I can't tell you for sure where this movie really, what this movie really covers. But I will tell you, um, going into the film, uh, I didn't have a lot of expectation. Um, there was a lot of like, you know, word about, you know, the the length of this film only being an hour and thirty five minutes. People having some problems with that, um, and and the fact that they did not uh, lift embargo until the last minute had people worried about this movie. Um, I will say for me, uh, I thought the movie was okay. Uh, it does seem like it's a movie that wants to be bigger than it is. It feels like it has these big, big ideas, but it only lets it go so far. Uh, it's very constrained by the fact that it is only an hour, 35 minutes. Um, I do think that the relationship between the main actor and Idris Elba's character uh, was pretty good. I thought that they had a good little uh, relationship. There's some humorous moments also. Uh, I think Matthew McConaughey was just fine, even though I look at the characters being very one dimensional uh, and, and they just don't go into the character and his motivations that much. Um, I think some of the uh, visuals were actually pretty awesome. Um, there's some, some action scenes towards the end that are uh, well constructed. I thought were pretty cool, but uh, ultimately it's just, you know, for what the material seems to be, which is a really good uh, series of novels, something that people were very passionate about it seems like they let people down and, 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 it, and even for just the movie by itself, um, it was just a very okay movie. Um, I don't know if that I would recommend going to see it in theaters. It's one of the movies that you might want to just wait till it comes out on VOD or, or Netflix or whatever. Uh, it's not a must see. Um, but if you're into the, if you're into Steve, this Stephen King novels and you really want to check it out, go check it out. See what you think. Um, like to hear what you guys think. So just leave it in the comments or whatever. Let us know. Um, but now we're going to move on. We're going to get back to the Stephen King adaptations. And we're now to number three. Andrew, what is your number three? Uh, my number three is what is considered an all-time classic coming-of-age movie. And that is Stand By Me. Um, this film is, I think, a film that every young person, I think, needs to watch. Because the themes in it are so universal. You know, it's all about... Uh, just kids trying to figure out who they are and dealing with life, and they're dealing with a lot of serious stuff in the film. But they're also they're also children, so it's 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 very complex, and it has a wonderful cast of really young actors that many of you know of now because they're adults: uh, Will Wheaton, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, Jerry O'Connell, Kiefer Sutherland, and coincidentally, this is another Stephen King adaptation directed by Rob Reiner. That is just an interesting coincidence that I had them back to back. I'm just kind of putting that together now. And it's it's interesting how well Rob Reiner is able to translate Stephen King's work. I kind of wish he would take another stab at it um, now. I don't know what Rob Reiner is doing now, but I would like to see him perhaps adapt another Stephen King uh, novel onto the screen because there are just many, many Stephen King books and, and things he's written that, that can make their way onto onto the screen, and I know they're they're redoing it. I know they're redoing The Stand. I mean, uh, The Dark Tower, They who knows what they're going to do with that. As Stephen said, it's a very okay movie, which is what I've been hearing as well. But yeah, Stand By Me is one of those all-time classic coming-of-age films. Um, it's definitely worth your time. It has a lot of classic moments, a lot of moments that have been um, reenacted in pop culture, um, and a lot of lines that are very memorable in it. And a lot of great performances from young from a young cast, and that's something to say because I've always said this: uh, young actors in a movie can make or break a movie. They can be great or they can be bad, and and if they're bad, they tank it all. But this film, they are fantastic. Most definitely, most definitely. Uh, my number three um, is one that uh, it's it's just kind of it's another director that's done a couple adaptations from Stephen King also, and that is. Frank Darabont, and this one is uh, The Green Mile. Uh, the Green Mile um, stars Michael Clark Duncan, Tom Hanks. Uh, you know, you got some uh, Sam Rockwell in there, which Sam Rockwell, to me, kind of steals this movie uh, as the main serial killer. Uh, I think it's Billy the Kid is his name in the movie, I think. Um, but this movie is about um, 
uh, these kids, uh, it's set in, it's set in like, I think the forties or I think thirties or forties. Um, and it's, uh, basically Tom Hanks plays like a prison guard on death row and these kids get killed. And apparently Marco clock Duncan's the one that had done it. So he gets brought in to death row and he's just this huge man. You know, he's already a huge man in real life when he was alive, uh, rest in peace, Marco Clark Duncan. Um, but they make him even bigger in this movie. This, this dude's gotta be eight foot tall or something like it's, he, he's huge. And, um, brings him in and, and it's just about kind of, it, it goes down this weird path of, of, you know, semi fantasy kind of like almost kind of religious uh, overtone kind of stuff going on in this movie. And it's a very good, I, the performances all around in this film are just fantastic. Marco Clark Duncan, I don't think was ever better than he was in this film. Um, Tom Hanks uh, going through, he's going through, not only is he going through the situations he's having with the situation with Michael Clark Duncan, but um, uh, which is uh, coffee is his name. Uh, like the drink, as he says. And uh, <laughs> um, he's also dealing with personal health issues and stuff like that. And um, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's a very interesting movie. And Frank Darabont, man, he's just, uh, he needs to do more movies. Um, he's actually done, I, I forgot, he's actually done three adaptations of Stephen King movies. Uh, he, he's also done, I'm not, we might talk about some of these other ones. I'm not going to bring them up, but he's right. done three adaptations of Stephen King. So I, not only would I would like him to see another Stephen, do another Stephen King, he just needs to do more movies. What are you doing, man? I know you did the walking dead and then you kind of, you got fired from that and do something else. Cause you're so awesome. You're so great at making films. Um, but yeah, the green mile is, is, is one of them. I think that, I mean, it's one of them that people I think forget is a Stephen King movie because he's, you, you typically think Stephen King, you think horror films um, or psychological thrillers. And this one's more of like a, weird um it's it's a it's 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 kind of hard to put your your finger on the what you would call this it's a drama uh i guess you would say more than anything fantasy drama it's 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 an odd movie but it's it's a worth a watch but uh number three is green mile and um now we're moving to number two and andrew what is number two yeah um just talking about the green mile i'm glad you mentioned it it would have been in my honorable mentions but this movie um, traumatized me as, as a young person. It came out in 99. I probably saw it like sometime after, like renting it on VHS or it was on uh, pay cable at the time. So I was like 13, 14. This movie traumatized me so much because of how depressing and dark and emotional this film is. And I haven't been able to rewatch it since. And I own it. <laughs> and I can't watch it again just because I remember just being so emotionally traumatized by that movie it's a it's it's a tough movie to watch frank darabont uh deals with a lot of dark stuff in his movies which is segueing into my number two which is uh the shawshank redemption also directed by frank darabont uh and this film is regarded as one of the best films of all time certainly one of the best in the last 30 years of movies easily this movie is famously remembered for not winning uh, best picture or any of that because um, uh, because uh, Forrest Gump took all of its took all of its Oscars from it. It was nominated for seven Oscars and it won zero, none. And I would say this movie has aged much better than most of the movies back in the early '90s. Granted, this was 1994 when three of the best picture nominees were Shawshank, uh, Pulp Fiction, and uh, Forrest Gump. So it was literally a a three-way battle there and these and these are all films that people reference and talk about all the time but Shawshank is yet again one of those films that is just incredible um the acting by Tim Robbins Morgan Freeman's in the film and uh Clancy Brown plays one of the prison guards I've always been a big fan of Clancy Brown um he played the Kurgan and one of my favorite kind of cult classics of all time a uh, Highlander uh, just a great, great voice. and a lot of voiceover work. But yeah, this is a film that kind of centers around a prison um, and centers around the character of Andy Dufresne, as well as um, the character of Morgan Freeman and Ellis Redding. And it's kind of about their friendship, their relationship, and kind of just, um, just kind of the way these characters interact with one another and how they go about living in this prison. You know, Andy Dufresne... You're really not quite sure what he did to get there. You really don't know if he actually committed a crime or not, but it's an interesting character journey for both of these men. 
And it's a film that many people could say they can watch and rewatch all the time because of how good it is. And yeah, there's that iconic shot, which I always love, when Andy Dufresne finally gets out of this prison, spoiler alert, and the rain is pouring down and the camera pans up and he's just finally literally free and figuratively free. It's it's a great film. I it, I can't recommend this film enough for people. It's it's a quintessential. Um, if there is a modern day classics that we're starting to make from films from the '90s, because you know time is moving, uh, this is definitely up there. It's it's one of the top classics of the '90s when we start talking about '90s classics. Can't agree more. Might talk about that later. Um, <laughs> I, thought we, I, thought, I thought you were going to talk about it now. <laughs> no, but number two, my number two is Stand By Me. Stand By Me, um, as you talked about, uh, directed by Rob Reiner. And um, yeah, it's it's just, it, it, it's one of the first movies I think of when I think coming of age uh, stories. Um, and it is, it can be very dark at times. You even got Kiefer Sutherland in this movie as kind of like a teenager, a little bit older than our main characters. Um, it's kind of a douche and is, is, you know, th th these kids are going to look for this dead body of a dead kid. I mean, it's just that alone sounds dark. Um, but of course all these kids are going through their own things and, and the camaraderie is great. Um, and of course this is kind of a theme you see when it comes to like, even nowadays when they're kind of trying to recreate that eighties magic with like stranger things. Um, you know, the, how the Goonies was back then too, also is another influence. Um, but like with stranger things, and of course it is another example of another Stephen King story with a bunch of kids. It's kind of a, a trope, another trope of Stephen King stories. Um, but it's, it's a definite, like, it's not only a good Stephen King adaptation, but it's a good, just a good film. Um, and, and it's, it's, I can't suggest to go see it more. Andrew's already filled in a lot of the blanks for what I could say. But it's, yeah, it's a must-see movie. And once again, like I said, Rob Rayner, awesome. River Phoenix uh, kind of makes his star known in this movie. Um, I feel like, I think, I think you know, I don't know if he'd done this. Did he do this before uh, his appearance in Last Crusade? Oh, yeah, this was before Last Crusade. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I think he kind of makes a statement for for his, his, his acting ability in this movie. I think this is where, where he really starts. Um and then of course he, he goes too early for us. He dies in his early twenties. Uh, and that's just, it's just sad. Um, but it's a, it's a must see movie guys. Check it out. And now we are down to the number ones, the Kings of the Hill, as I like to say, um, what is your number one? I think I know what it is, but I'm not going to say it. Ooh, he thinks he knows. I do, I do know what it is actually. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell him that. He just, he's just guessing. I'm guessing uh, and I know. Uh, what is interesting about this number one is it is an adaptation that Stephen King doesn't actually like. <laughs> and that is, of course, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining from 1980, a film that was not loved when it came out and was actually nominated for some Razzies Awards. And that has turned out to be complete and other crap because this film is now an all-time classic when it comes to the horror genre. It is referenced and talked about constantly. Um, if you are not familiar with this film, man, it's a trip. This movie is a trip. It's slow. It is uh, It is slow building. It is, it is a slow burn. But once you get to the end and essentially all chaos just unleashes upon this, this, this hotel up in the mountains, it's very cold. It's very remote. You feel isolated there. And Jack Nicholson gives one of his most unhinged performances you'll ever see. It is jack to his literal craziness <laughs> you know what i mean um basically jack nicholson plays a character named jack torrance who is basically hired to take care of this hotel I believe it's called the overlook hotel and it is uh kind of closed for the season so there's nobody there there's nobody uh there's no guests there's nobody um that he has to really watch over just basically keeping up you know keeping the place clean keeping your uh everything going okay, and he brings his family there. His wife, portrayed by Shelley Duvall, accompanies him and his, and his young son. And basically, he slowly and slowly slips into insanity. He goes there to write a book, and he kind of, and he kind of goes crazy because of that, goes crazy because of the hotel is probably haunted by past, by past uh, uh, traumatic events that happened there. And it's really tough to explain. You have to experience this movie for yourself. It is directed by my favorite director of all time, Stanley Kubrick, 
and he uses a lot of handheld camera work that wasn't really done at the time, and he utilizes a lot of just crazy angles and kind of like tortures his actors to get the most crazy uh, performances from them. There is a very famous behind the scenes um, special feature you can watch on the DVD or the Blu-ray that shows that shows him really being an asshole to everybody. And that's kind of how tough Stanley Kubrick was. He's notorious for doing a, a just ungodly amount of takes. He made that poor kid do like 150 takes for one scene. It was, it's, it's bananas, <laughs> just bananas. And that's pretty much how this movie is bananas. Steven, uh, what's your number one? Cause I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think you know what it is. I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but uh, uh, yeah, it, this one, um, my number one is, is uh, it's like you said, it's so rewatchable. Uh, I, I, it's it's tat. One of the lines of the movie is tattooed on my arm, Ooh. guys. Um, get busy living or get busy dying, and that is Shawshank Redemption. Um, yeah, uh, if you you could probably flip through the channels of cable and find this movie on every day, uh, uh, every day of the week, 24 seven, you'll find Shawshank Redemption somewhere, uh, because it is so good. Um, this movie, I could, I could watch it back to back times. It, it's just that good. I mean, from the performances from Tim Robbins, Morgan Freeman, um, it, it's, it's just a perfect movie for me. I, 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 I can't help it. It's, it's, um, say what to know um <laughs> you know and then just this plan that he, he just you know uh, he just he rigs up he's just he's the smartest guy in the room man and uh and just it's so satisfying at the end uh when he he gets away and he 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 tunnels out of there with just a little pickaxe um it's just it's fantastic um and yeah uh that shot with the rain is just iconic um it, yeah I can't I can't say not enough about it. It's it's just one of the movies that um is just a is just if you it, I would be surprised if you haven't seen it. If I if I ever come along somebody that says they have not seen the Shawshank Redemption, I'm going to be like what the hell have you been doing like with your life? Like where where you do not watch anything? Like you not like flip through the channels at least once through your life to have come across it because it's on AMC like every day. <laughs> um, but it's also, of course, like I said, Frank Darabont bout Frank Darabont directed this also. He also directed the mist, which was the other one um, that I, I was, I was alluding to, um, which the mist was okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, yeah, Shawshank Redemption is my number one. It was always my number one uh, unless uh, Stephen King has another great adaptation. I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But before we go into our honorable mentions, let me read off Mr. Dan Skip Allen's list. Um, he sent it to me. His number five is Needless Things. Uh, never seen it. Uh, might be needless. <laughs> uh, number four is Christine, which is the car film, the killer car film. Um, number three is Carrie, which I like Carrie. Uh, Brian De Palma, uh, you know, it's a pretty good movie. Um, number two is Misery which we had on our lists. We appreciate that film. And Andrew's going to appreciate this. Number one, The Shining. He agrees with Andrew as his number one uh, Stephen King film. Uh, hit one of his honorable mentions is Cujo, the killer dog movie, which, okay. <laughs> what is interesting is if you were watching this show, usually, uh, uh, usually Stephen and I maybe have some weird lists, but Dan usually is never that weird. Uh, a very interesting list from from Dan. Uh, yeah. Interesting, Shawshank is not on it. Which it's is interesting that Shawshank shocking. or Green Mile is not on it um, for me. I'm shocked about Shawshank. Or Stand By Me. All right. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. I, Moving I, I on think now. he was maybe purposely trying to be different. Yeah, I get Yeah, I mean, he's not. Like, like you said, we've done that before ourselves. Because everybody's going to have Shawshank on their list somewhere. Yeah. It's going to be a list that everyone makes. Yeah. And of course, with me, my honorable mentions, of course, The Shining is fantastic. Uh, it's just one of the movies I don't go back and rewatch too often just because I'm not as, in, as an enthusiastic uh, um, 
Kubrick fan. I mean, I like some of his work, but I'm not like over the moon for his work. And in the shining itself is just really long. It's one of the movies you have to kind of be in the mood to watch. Um, and then uh, and like some other ones that we, we haven't even talked about, like maximum overdrive is another, uh, it's got Emilio Estevez. It's another kind of, uh, you know, horror movie, car horror movie, kind of weird movie. Um, and uh, Pet Cemetery is another one that I actually fought with putting on the list uh, at number five because I really like Pet Cemetery, and they're actually talking about remaking that. Um, the same director that just directed the It remake is thinking about wanting to di direct a remake of Pet Cemetery. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, you have any honorable mentions, Andrew? Um, yeah, um, The Mist I think is somewhat underrated. Um, it's a really good film with Tom Jane, hell of an ending that apparently is much different than the book. I would. I, I was. I was gonna say. Sorry to interrupt, but if you're gonna watch that movie, I would say watch it in black and white because there's a black and white version and it's way better. I've actually not seen the black and white version, but I really want to. Um, what other films? Are, there's Mist, uh, Green Mile, which we both talked about. Um, Christine, I think, is actually underrated. It's kind of fun. It's kind of crazy when you think about the whole concept of it, and I really, I like it as kind of like a cult film almost. But yeah, Stephen King has so many more uh, adaptations. I mean, Pet Cemetery, Cat's Eye, Salem's Lot, uh, Dreamcatcher. There's so many of his. Cujo. Uh, Children of the Corn. Children of the Corn, which both Stephen and I are not big fans of, but it is yet again a cult film that a lot of people do like. Um, and yeah, there's so many more. The Running Man, Firestarter. You could go on. We could go on for like another half hour just listing these. Yeah. But... That's going to be it for this show, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, Andrew, where can you be found? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Cabzilla06, as well as my YouTube channel, Cabzilla Productions. And I'm Stephen Billings. Uh, you can find me on Film Club Central doing rapid reactions, doing doing a few different things. Uh, you know, we're going to we're working. We're in pre-production on uh, doing a new uh, comedy sketch show. Uh, not sketch show, but a comedy show web series called Showbiz, where we're a bunch of movie people trying to get into the movie uh, industry, and we're not really good at it. Um, and uh, also, like I said at the beginning of the show, this show is also going to be uploaded to the Best Damn Movie Show channel, so you can catch this again there. Um, and from what I understand, next the next week is going to be the beginning of a Classics Month. Um, where we're talking all classic topics. Um, I, and the first one I think we're doing is Hitchcock. So we're going to be talking our top five Hitchcock films. Um, I think we're going to be doing, I think at, at, each week we're going to be doing a classic subject. So stay tuned for that. And then after that, I think the beginning of next month is our year anniversary. So we might do something special. I'm not sure yet, but stay tuned for that. And that's going to be it for this episode. Thanks for watching again, and we will see you next time.